Okay. All right, uh, what I have here is the uh, uh, a sample of the uh, practice test. Um, of course, the numbers and such are uh, always varied. Um, so what I'm going to do today is uh, just go through it um, to uh, help you be ready for uh, for the real test. Uh, so test two is uh, due on uh, Friday, October 30th at um, 1159 p.m. Um, I will not be holding actual class uh, next week. I will be available in case of questions, um, but I'm not going to be covering anything new until, <coughs> excuse me, until after the test. <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so um, just going through these, you know, 13 problems, uh, one by one. Um, what's asked for here is uh, determining intervals in which the function is uh, increasing or decreasing. Um, so it's important that uh, you tell the difference visually. Uh, remember, increasing or decreasing is defined in terms of how does the y value behave as x increases? So as you go from left to right, you know, so increasing x, what's happening to the y? So what we have right here, this first segment, um, that is increasing because as I go from left to right, the y value is going up. Um, similarly, this segment here also uh, increasing. And here we have the opposite behavior. As I go from left to right, the y value is going down, so that is uh, decreasing. Um, so once you de determine which segment is doing what, which segments are increasing or decreasing, then you need to specify the intervals for each. Um, so here, this is the leftmost segment, so this interval starts at minus infinity. So you're just making an assumption that this behavior continues for um, all of our x uh, to the left. Um, so this interval will start at minus infinity and go to this point. So be careful reading the hash marks in the graph to determine what the actual coordinates are. And for the intervals you'll enter, here's your answer for increasing, decreasing. It's x values. I've seen some students get confused and use y values instead. It's These intervals are just x values. Um, so here at x equal to minus 1 is where this... Uh, interval ends. So we see here the first interval, you can see the answer down here, minus infinity to minus one is where it is uh, increasing. And then starting from minus one up until this point, so check the uh, grid lines, it's x equal three is where this stops. So the interval from minus one to three is where it is uh, decreasing. And then the remaining intervals picking up from x equal three and then going off to uh, infinity is uh, also increasing. And remember when you enter your intervals, um, since there are multiple intervals for the increasing category in this case, uh, separate them uh, by commas. Okay. Um, So um, be sure, to, uh, feel free to chime in at any point with uh, uh, questions um, as I go through these. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay, so now for this function, give it split across pages, unfortunately. Uh, find all values of x that correspond to horizontal tangent line. So I'm going to make some notes in this document as I go. Um, OK, um, so when I say horizontal tangent lines, what that means is, and uh, I will uh, post this with my annotations um, after class. Sorry. Apparently can't type. Come on. 
Okay. So horizontal tangent line means that the derivative is equal to zero. Um, so what we need to do is go up here and uh, take the derivative, and that's going to require the uh, quotient rule. Um, so I'll just uh, fill that in here. Um, oh, it looks like I had done it previously uh, when I was going through this before. So um, I'll just go ahead and use that. So bottom times the derivative of the top, which is one from the x, minus uh, top times the derivative of the bottom, which is also one, all over the denominator x plus four uh, squared. Um, and then uh, there's simplifying that happens here. So we, we have x and minus x, those will cancel. And then we have four minus a minus two, so six. So, uh, so uh, six over x plus four squared. Um, now, what we can see here is that the numerator denominator, uh, both positive, um, or the denominator can be zero, but the point is, this is never going to be negative. And because the numerator is this non-zero constant, six, um, the uh, derivative will never be zero. So, um, so the answer for this part here, step one, would be none, um, because if a derivative is defined at all, it will be positive. Um, so then for the second part of the question, um, okay. Um, so determine the intervals in which it's increasing or decreasing. Um, now, increasing means a derivative is positive. Decreasing means that the derivative is negative. We've already seen that the derivative can't be negative, so right away you enter uh, the empty set uh, so using their keypad, the empty set symbol um, for decreasing. Now for increasing, one thing you have to be careful about is the fact that the function is undefined at one point. At x equal minus 4, the denominator is 0. So that should not be included in whatever uh, interval. So uh, for all other x, it's increasing. So that's why for the answer here, um, you don't say minus infinity to infinity. If a function is defined everywhere, then you would. But because it's undefined at minus four, you break it up at minus four. So you have minus infinity to minus four. So really, if x equals minus four is excluded, and then minus four to infinity um, is uh, um, included. OK. Um, well, honestly, if someone put minus infinity to infinity, I would certainly at least give partial credit for that. Because um, the main thing here is it's, it's certainly never decreasing. OK. Uh, for this next one, uh, critical values. So that, too, is, means it has the same meaning as a horizontal tangent. So critical values can also happen where the derivative is is not defined, but that never seems to come up in problems that we have. So for our purposes, we can think of it as points where the derivative is equal to zero uh, as a critical value. So for that, we need the derivative. Um, actually, want to do this over here. So power rule, so two times five halves, uh, you're bringing the exponent down, so we would, that would simplify to five. And then we subtract one from the exponent, so that's x to the three halves, and then minus five, and then the minus 10 contributes nothing. So that's the derivative. And then we set that equal to zero, but then we're just gonna get five x to the three halves, is equal to 5, and then you divide both sides by 5. So you just get x to the 3 halves is equal uh, to 1. Um, so then, um, now normally what you would do is you would then raise both sides um, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, two thirds power to get rid of the 
um, exponent of three halves. So we have x to three halves, all raised to the two thirds, and that would be equal to one raised to the two thirds. Um, that way the exponents cancel because if you have x to a power, then raise that to a power, you multiply the exponents and you would get just plain old x. But one to the two thirds is one. So I mean, it's more than needed for this particular problem with these particular numbers. But if you had something else here, a different number than one, you would need to raise both sides to the two thirds power to figure out what the uh, uh, value should be. Um, <clears throat> so, so x equals one is the critical value. That's where the derivative is uh, equal to zero. So that's what you fill in here. Um, and then, um, for the, um, uh, um, second step, first derivative test to find any local extrema. So, um, so I'll summarize what that means. Um, so if, uh, if a function changes from increasing to decreasing, so, uh, so in other words, the derivative is positive, then it becomes zero, then it goes negative. Um, so what that means is we have a uh, local max. Um, Similarly, if a function changes from decreasing to increasing, as you go by the critical point, that is a, a local min. So equivalently, plus to minus is a max, minus to plus um, is a min. Um, there is no sign change, so it's always increasing or always decreasing on both sides of the critical point, then it is neither one. Um, so if we, Go back to the derivative that we have, knowing it's equal to zero when x equals one. What you would do is choose uh, x values on either side of one. Like you could pick uh, x equals zero to the left. So if I plug in x equals zero, you're getting at minus five. So their derivative is negative. If I choose a uh, x equal two, so then I have five times two to the three halves. Uh, but um, well, what, what that would mean if you plug it in your calculator. Um, you won't get a nice number, but what you'll find is uh, 5x, 5 times 2 to the 3 halves is greater than 5, so you'll get a positive value. So, um, so in this case, um, the function is uh, goes from um, decreasing to increasing because the derivative is negative when x is uh, uh, less than 1, and it's uh, positive when x is greater than 1, so thus we have a local minimum at uh, x equals one. Now, um, that's the only critical point. That turned out to be a min, so we have no max. So that's why you would fill in none for the uh, a local max. Um, now here, we, um, we need to substitute x equals one into the original function. So, so here you have your critical point for the x value, for the y value, it's f of one. So you have to go back, original function, plug x equal one in here. Um, so you get uh, one to the five halves is just one. So you'll have two minus five minus 10 is minus 13. Um, and that's the ordered pair that uh, goes in here. Next one. Uh, here we're looking for absolute max and min. Um, so what you do is you also take the derivative. Um, 
So using a power rule, we get 4x minus 4. Um, and you set that equal to 0. So your critical value is x equal to 1. So that's where at one point at which there might be a max or a min, but then you also have to consider the endpoints. So your candidates for max or min, absolute max or min, are 0, 1, and 4. So 0 and 4 by virtue of being the endpoints, 1 by virtue of being a critical value. So then all of these you plug into the original function uh, to determine uh, which is a uh, max, which is a min. So you plug in x equals zero, you get zero. You plug in x equal one, you get two minus four, which is minus two, so that's less. If you plug in x equal four, you get uh, four times four, 16 times two is 32, minus 16 is 16. So 16 was the largest value, so that's the absolute max. So, and do we order pair, x is four, y is f of four, which is 16. And then the smallest of those y values was minus two. Um, and that happened at x equal one. So that's what goes here for the um, absolute minimum. Uh, this is the exact same type of problem, uh, finding the absolute max or min. So we have to consider x equal 9, x equal 16, and also uh, um, whatever critical values that we get uh, from a derivative. So the derivative in this case, we have uh, 6. And then 1 over x, this comes up a lot. The derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. And then the 10, 14 is still going to sit there. So it's 10, 14 over x squared and we have to set that um, equal to zero um, okay um let's see what's this ah we have one more okay um, all right, so here's our derivative, and we set that equal to zero. So then what we get is um, x squared is equal to 1014 divided by 6. Um, so your calculator will tell you that that's uh, 169. Um, and that happens to be a perfect square, so x is plus or minus 13. But when you have this situation, make sure that any critical values uh, that you get, only use the ones that fall within the interval. I've already seen some cases of students using this whatever critical values they got, regardless of whether in this interval. When it's an absolute max or min problem, you have to consider only what's in this interval uh, from 9 to 16. So. So 13 will be considered, but not minus 13. So, so be on the lookout for that. Um, so then your candidates for absolute max or min are x equals uh, 9, 13, 16. Um, so you'll substitute those three values into the original function, like before. Um, and we happen to get um, the smallest value happening at uh, x is 13. Um, at that critical point, and then the uh, smallest value happening at uh, um, x equal 9. Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, here we're trying to maximize uh, revenue. Uh, so here's our given. Uh, uh, revenue function, um, and considering an x between 0 and 21. 
Um, now, um, we proceed as before. We need the derivative. So that'd be a 72 minus um, 4x, and you set that equal to zero. Um, so then you just uh, solve that. So x would be 72 or 4, so we get uh, 18. Um, and uh, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the x value because x is the number of units. Um, and that's what the question is asking for. How many units should be sold to maximize uh, revenue? Um, and uh, but what you can do to uh, um, make certain is uh, to uh, also consider these endpoints, uh, 0 and 21. But if you plug in x equals 0, uh, you'll get 0, which you'd expect because uh, you're not going to get any revenue if you don't sell anything. Um, and if you also plugged in uh, x equal um, uh, 21, Um, okay, so I'll just, uh, so R of 0 is 0, R of 21 happens to be equal to 630, um, and if you plug in R of 18, uh, the critical point, um, you get something slightly greater, uh, 648. So sure enough, that is where the maximum occurs, uh, so X equals 18, uh, since they want the number of units sold is what you would uh, uh, fill in here. All right, uh, this problem we're dealing with the uh, second derivative. Um, so remember to uh, take the derivative twice. Um, so after getting, bringing the three down, so minus 12x squared plus 16x plus six, and then you take the uh, derivative again. Um, so it'd be 24x plus, I'm sorry, min minus 24x uh, plus 16. Um, and then what's asked for in the second part of a problem is simply evaluating the second derivative you get at three x three given x values, um, it astounds me how many students uh, get this part wrong, um, and often clicking "do not exist." This is not going to happen unless there's some divide by zero, zero situation, um, and even then that probably only apply to maybe one of the x values. So this this almost never happens. <laughs> so um, uh, so, so go ahead and you know, grind for the algebra, uh, substitute these x values in, and, and um, uh, now if, if you have a, a situation where someone gets an incorrect result for um, the second derivative, therefore, unfortunately, you lose some points on step one. But if you take whatever you did get for step one and carried out this properly in step two, this is something that I can check. Um, so therefore, I can give you at least uh, some credit for, for doing that right. Um, just as if you happen to get this right, but plug things in wrong down here. <clears throat> but as, I see a lot of students get mixed up on which sort of is asked for. Uh, always pay attention to whether it's F prime or F double prime for first or second <coughs> derivative. Um, this next one with the square root, that's going to be a bit of a pain. Um, it's supposed to determine whether a function is concave up or concave down. That requires a second derivative. So just as with increasing or decreasing, you wanted to know if a first derivative was positive or negative. Uh, now you want to know if a second derivative is positive or negative. So work that out over here. This is 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half power. So we have 1 half 10x squared plus 4. So the minus one half times the derivative of what's inside here, which would be 20 X. Um, and after cleaning all that up. So we have one half times 20 X, so that'd be 10 X all over. Uh, and then 
Here we have 10x squared plus 4 to the minus 1 half, but that's the same as 10x squared plus 4 to the plus 1 half in the denominator. Um, so then you'd have to uh, use the uh, quotient rule to, uh, if you have it written like this, uh, the quotient rule to take the derivative of this, of f prime, which would therefore be the second derivative um, of f. Um, and that's something that's going to be a bit of a mess. Um, all right, so we have um, x squared plus 4 to the 1 half times 10, a derivative of 10x, minus 10x times a derivative of this. But this right here, uh, 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half, that actually is our original function. And um, so we actually have a derivative of that already. That's exactly what needs to go right here. So I have um, 10x again over 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half. So let's see if I can move this. Oh, I can. Okay. Um, I actually want to move it further. I'm actually not sure how I was able to do that the first time. Um, now, this, what I have here is just the numerator. Um, Okay, and then I need to um, divide that by this, but this is 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half squared. That's just 10x squared plus 4. Um, and ultimately, we have to find out where this is uh, um, positive or negative, um, which can be very difficult to do the way it's written now. Um, I'm going to condense this 10x times 10x. That's the same as 100 x squared. Um, but um, now, now what we can do is focus exclusively on the numerator because the derivative is only going to be equal to zero um, when the numerator is zero. We can forget about the denominator. Also, the denominator is never going to be zero. It's, this, is, this is always going to be strictly positive, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so to see where there might be some kind of inflection point, um, then we, so if we look at this numerator, what we have is, if, we, if I set this equal to zero, I'll just do this down here. Um, so I have, uh, 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half times 10 is equal to, so I take all this part, all this and move it to the other side of the equation, f double prime equals 0. So that's 100x squared um, over 10x squared plus 4 to 1 half. Um, so then what I could do, I could try to um, simplify this. And the way I can do that is I can multiply both sides by um, 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half. So I get rid of it in the denominator here. Um, and um, okay, so see this question in the chat. Um, I need to clarify your, your question. Um, about because you put uh, when you, I'm not sure what you mean by the stars. Um, because it's normally when you are, are typing a slash. It assumes you want a fraction, so it starts creating that for you. Um, now, keep in mind. Uh, so, I, I don't think it'll present a problem, but I will tell you that, as I did in you know, test one, um, even if Hawks were to count it wrong, I won't count it wrong because I, I will review your every answer. 
uh, and look for chances to give either partial or in some cases it happens to be full uh, credit. So, uh, so I so I can tell you just from my manual review, this will not be a problem. Okay. All right. So now I'll um, multiply both sides by 10x squared plus 4 to the 1 half. So now we'll only have 100x squared on the right side. On the left side, we're going to have 10x squared plus 4 um, times 10 is equal to 100x squared. Um, but then what you could do is you can just take the 10 and distribute it through here. So this is the same as 100x squared plus 40. And then the 10 goes away because it's been distributed. Um, and what we can see here is uh, this equation um, can never be satisfied. Uh, for one thing, 100x squared would cancel out, and you'd have 40 equals 0. So what that says is the, the um, second derivative um, can... Uh, um, can, can uh, never be equal to zero. Uh, very, very, so we're, um, we, we don't call it a critical value because that's our first derivative, but there's no possibility of an inflection point. Um, now, what you can do then is uh, find out, okay, so now what, what, the, what this says is a dri the second derivative is either always positive or always negative, but which we don't actually know yet. Um, so what you can do to resolve that is um, just set x, uh, plug in any x value whatsoever. Easiest one would be x equals zero. So if you plug in x equals zero uh, up here, um, this term that I'm highlighting, uh, that will go away. Um, and up here, this will go away, but you'll still be left with a number. You'll have uh, four to the one half times 10. Uh, that's 20, so that's, that's positive. Um, and then the de denominator, also positive. So you're going to get a positive value uh, if you plug anything into the second derivative. Um, so um, that means the function's concave up everywhere. So you would enter minus infinity to infinity for concave up and none for uh, uh, concave down. Um, so in general, uh, determine concave over concave down. First, you know, take a second derivative, see where it's equal to zero, if anywhere. Um, and then, uh, uh, once you see whether it's, uh, um, where it is equal to zero at, at all, then, uh, plug in X values to determine positive or negative, um, away from those points. Um, and if it's not zero anywhere, you just plug in one X value to determine positive or negative, uh, for concave up or concave down. <coughs> Um, the, uh, um, I'm trying to remember, I remember, I remember stepping through a problem like this in the notes, um, uh, a problem just like this one, and I'm, so that, that's something that would have been, uh, a few lessons ago, um, I think this is like toward the end of, uh, Chapter three, um, and I'm trying to find that right now because that's. Um, I think I have found it. In fact, yes. Um, so I can point you to where in the notes I would recommend looking. Um, okay. Oh. So because of screen share, it's right here in front of you. <laughs> October 8th. <laughs> um, and then uh, this problem, number six, look, the function has the same form. So here I've worked out in more detail um, how you go about simplifying to get a derivative. And notice it actually becomes quite simple in the end. And here also you can see, um, you know, since the denominator is always positive, the numerator is a positive constant. Um, and therefore, um, second derivative is always positive.
All right. Um, second step, if there had been a point where the uh, second derivative was equal to zero, you would, it, it would change sign. So remember, point of inflection requires, uh, has to change sign for there to be uh, an inflection point. Um, so if it second derivative changes sign from plus to minus, um, so it's, uh, um, or minus to plus. That is a point of inflection. Doesn't matter what kind of sign change it is, um, but any kind of sign change, um, that's what you would declare here. But here, we already saw a second derivative is always positive, so we would enter none um, in this case. Uh, but I'm pointing this out because if there was a point where f double prime was equal to zero, but it went from positive to positive again, um, that's not a point of inflection. <clears throat> All right. Now with this function here, what's asked for is uh, first and second derivatives. Um, and then once you, um, and this, so here we have a very much a multi-step uh, problem. Um, so here, just carry out the power rule to get these derivatives here. Um, step two, you're just working with a first derivative, and you're going to um, set that uh, equal to zero. So what we have here is uh, f double prime. Uh, sorry, f prime increasing or decreasing is f prime. Um, so we have four uh, x cubed is equal to 108. Divide by four, you get x cubed equals 27. That is a perfect cube. Or if you don't remember that, your calculator will tell you that x is equal to three. Uh, so that is a critical point. So then what you would do is uh, substitute values to the left and right of uh, x equal three to determine increasing or decreasing. So for x less than three, you can choose like x equals zero and you get a negative value. So therefore it is, uh, decreasing for x less than three. So the interval is minus infinity up to three. Uh, you plug in something uh, greater than three, like uh, x equal four in here, um, and you'd have uh, 256 minus 108. So that you get a positive value. Um, so a function is increasing from three to infinity. That's, that's the usual procedure and as seen in other problems. Uh, find a derivative is equal to zero and then plug in points between any critical points to determine uh, if a, wherever derivative is uh, positive and negative. So let's put these reminders here. Okay. Third step, very similar procedure applied to the second derivative. Um, see where it is positive or negative. Um, so we go back, the second derivative turned out to be 12x squared. Now that's uh, always going to be non-negative uh, because of a squared. Um, so at x equals zero, it's zero, otherwise it's going to be positive. So if a function is uh, never going to be uh, concave down, it's going to be concave up everywhere. So from minus infinity to infinity. Um, so then all the information you gather from the previous parts uh, can be used to figure out any local max, min, or inflection points. Now, because the concavity never changes, it's always concave up. So right off the bat, you know there's not gonna be um, uh, any points of inflection. Um, now, the one critical point we had uh, was uh, x equal to three. And what we saw is uh, a function change at x equal three from increasing to decreasing. So it's going up, peaking, then going down. So that is a local maximum. Um, and here we only want the x value, not an ordered pair. Um, sorry, I apologize. I was just going from left to right 
with these intervals. Um, so hang on. Um, okay. Um, I'll just type it out here because apparently I just. Okay. Um, so x equals three. So so x less than three. Oh, I let this throw me off. I apologize. For x less than three, f is decreasing. So I'm going to type it out here. Just going from left to right, because that's really what the behavior you want to look at. Let's go three. Zero is the horizontal tangent. And then for x greater than three, f is increasing. OK, um, so what is happening is f changes from decreasing to increasing. So it's going down, then coming back up. Um, that is uh, local minimum at x equal three. I apologize if I cause any confusion. Does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> and that was the only critical point we had. Um, so it's three. Um, and so therefore, there was no, not even any candidate to have a, a local maximum. So there, um, All right, now we get to um, inventory problems. Um, and uh, these, these can certainly be a bit of a pain. Um, so here are uh, applications of finding um, maxes or mins. Um, so let's look at the facts that we have. So this amount to store one book for one year, uh, here we have a fixed cost of reordering, and then also a per unit cost of reordering, $3.10 each uh, book ordered. So, um, so what's the answer is what's 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 asked for is what's the lot size. So, how many units per order? How many orders are placed per year to make the cost a minimum? So, um, so inventory cost. Um, I'll just call this C of X. Um, that's going to be equal to storage cost plus reordering cost. So we figure out these two individually and then uh, and add them together to get the total cost and then we'll find a minimum of that. Um, I need some variables here. So I'll let uh, um, n be equal to number of orders per year. Um, and then we have, uh, I'll let x be equal units per order. Um, now, 120 books in total are going to be sold. So one thing we know about n and x is n times x must be equal to uh, 120. Um, so now we're going to use both of these variables to express storage cost and reordering cost. So the storage cost um, is going to be um, the cost to store one book times the number of books we expect to be storing at any one time. So the assumption that we make is however many books we order, on average, we're going to be having half that many in storage because first you have all X of them, and then over time you sell them and eventually you have none. So we just split the difference and assume that at any given time. Again, on average, we have um, X over two times $3.20 per books being stored. So that's, um, 1.6 times x, or $1.60 times x. 
Um, and then for the reordering cost, uh, well, there's the fixed cost of uh, 12 plus um, uh, $3.10 $3 per book ordered, but that's per order. Then we multiply that by N, the number of orders that are placed during the year. Um, so now if I multiply that out, that's going to be 12N plus $3.10 N times X. But we know what N times X is, that's 120. Um, okay. Um, also, um, what we have over here, we can express N in terms of X, so it's 120 uh, divided by X. Um, so now I can use that in here to express everything in terms of X. So um, that's going to be 12 times 120 over X, so that's 1440 over X, plus 310 times 120, Um, and that works out to be uh, 372. Okay. Um, so now the two costs are um, added together. Um, uh, so that's our C of X. So that'd be uh, 1.6 X plus 1440 over X plus 372. Okay. So we want to find where this is at a minimum. So we take the derivative. So 1.6. And remember, the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. Um, and we set that equal to 0. Um, so what that means is that uh, x squared is equal to 1440 over 1.6. Um, which happens to be 900. Um, so x equals plus or minus 30, but obviously we're dealing with a positive amount, so x turns out to be equal to 30. So that is where the minimum occurs. Um, so that's how many units per order. And then we go up back up here to get the number of orders. Um, so uh, 120 divided by 30 turns out to be 4. Um, so 30 books per order, four orders per year. So whatever value they give you for the total number of items to be sold during a year, your answers here and here must, the product of them must be equal to that amount. Um, th that's one thing I'm going to look for when it comes to uh, determining partial credit. Because um, that's, the, that's the only way your answers make sense <clears throat> is that orders per year times books per order, that equals books per year, and that must equal number that's given here. Um, but remember the assumption um, um, so anytime however many items you are you include in each order, half that many is um, your storage cost. Your storage cost is always going to be x over 2 times v. Um, so it's always, assuming you use the same notation to describe everything, 2 times um, the storage cost for one item, um, which is something that uh, would be given. All right, uh, here we have another applied uh, max or min problem. In this case, we're trying to maximize revenue. Um, so it's known that uh, this many bracelets so sells for uh, this amount per bracelet. Um, but if the um, price is increased, 
then fewer bracelets will be sold. But what is the ideal combination of price and uh, how many sold that would uh, lead to the maximum revenue? And there's different ways to look at this, but what I find particularly convenient is um, let X equal um, number of price hikes that are made because uh, you hike a price $125, then um, the number of bracelets goes down by four. Um, so this gives you a convenient way to express both price and units uh, sold. So the price, um, so that's going to be 1500 minus 125x. So you're reducing a price in $125 increments. Um, how many sold is going to be 96 minus 4x, because every time you make one of those $125, $125 $125 price increases, um, you're going to sell four fewer bracelets. So the product of these, so price per unit times units sold, that's for revenue. So R of X turns out to be equal to, just multiplying these two, so 1500 minus 125X, minus six minus four X. Um, and then, um, then you take the derivative of that, you want to find a maximum. So you're going to find our derivatives equal to zero. Um, since I haven't bothered to multiply these out, I'm just going to use a product rule. So I have uh, minus six minus four x times the derivative of this part, which is minus 125 plus 1500 minus 25 x times the derivative of this part, which is going to be um, uh, minus four. Um, so then all of this has to be uh, worked out. So uh, we're going to get 500x. Okay. Um, and then 4 times 125 is 500. See so here and here. So it turns out to be um, wait, that should be an equal sign. Okay. Um, so 1,000x, and then for a constants, I have uh, 96 times minus 125, um, and then minus 4 times 1,500. All right, um, so I get... Uh, 18,000. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, I guess this is just not my day. Can anyone tell me where, where my mistake is? I thought, I thought you toiled on this one. Because I remember. I'm sorry, I can't understand you. I remember. I'm telling us the foil on this. And you had those two cost functions, revenue functions. Okay. In my original notes, I'm sure that's what I did. You don't, you can do it either way. Okay. It, it, it doesn't matter. All right. Where did I make a mistake here? In coming up with a revenue function in the first place, there's a, there's a mistake here. Post, 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 add, like, I think 1500 plus 125. Yep. Yes, that's supposed to be a plus. Because I've been increasing a price. Here's a minus because the number of units sold goes down. Now, this will be relatively easy to fix, so I can just put a plus here. Um, okay, so that's going to give me a plus here and a plus here. Okay, so now I can fix all these things. That's going to give me um, minus uh, 1,000x. And then as far as the uh, constant, I'm going to have 125 times plus 96. And then, um, all right, so what I have here is um, 6,000.
Okay. Um, let's see. That should be. Wait, that's that's a plus. All right. So that's the derivative in its simplest form. Um, so then you set uh, derivative equals zero. So I have a minus 1,000 x equals 6,000. So x is equal to six. So that is how many price hikes are made of $125 each. Um, so then we have the price is going to be 1,500. That's your starting point. Plus six times 125. Um, and 125 times six, that's uh, 750. Um, 2250. Um, so that's the price that we get here. Again, I apologize. I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just off today. Um, so <laughs> it's been a week. Um, so if X is the number of price hikes, the price is the original price that's given plus <laughs> um, X times the amount of each price increase. Um, and then how many sold is uh, um, uh, the starting number of uh, units sold minus um, how many fewer per price hike uh, times the number of price hikes X. Okay, one thing I want to check here um, for when these things were covered. Oh, that's not the one I want. Um, here's uh, in the notes where a similar kind of problem was worked out, and you can see um, it uh, done out here. And yes, as it was uh, discussed earlier, in this case, I just went ahead and multiplied it out to get this, uh, to get the derivative that way. Um, honestly, um, while working this problem, here now, I just didn't feel like multiplying this out, and I knew I could get a derivative without doing so. So, but again, whichever approach you take, that's up to you. And certainly, if you do multiply it out, that does take making derivative easier. Easier. So, um, <laughs> pick your poison, I guess. Um, okay. Any questions about this one? I'm going to see if I can move these things around a bit. OK. Um, <laughs> this one's a quickie. Um, here we have a height of a projectile at a given time t. Um, and uh, oh, actually, this one's not so quick because it's three steps. But um, the uh, maximum height. Um, so, as in other problems, you're looking for a, uh, a critical point where the derivative is equal to zero. Um, so we take the derivative, and that'd be minus 4t plus 48, um, and you set that equal to zero. And what you'll get is uh, t is equal to uh, 12. Um, Uh, so what you'll do is um, take that value of t and substitute it into the original function. Um, so s of 12 um, is what, uh, actually I'll just move this to the answer box. Um, that's not literally what you type in. You got to take that t value and plug it in here. And when you do, 1152 is what you get. Uh, when will the projectile hit the ground? So that's when um, you're going to solve the equation. Um, S of t is uh, equal to zero. Um, so, um, so so then you what you do is set this equal to zero, and what we have here. Um, notice that um, 
each coefficient is divisible by two. And if you have minus two out here, so I'm going to factor out a minus two. So to get, um, so there's no way of writing s of t. So I've um, factored out minus two. I get uh, what's left is t squared minus 24t minus uh, 432. Um, and what you would do is you want to uh, set this equal to zero. Uh, so that it would in involve either uh, factoring. Uh, this, or if you don't feel comfortable trying to uh, factor it, um, you can always um, use the uh, qu uh, quadratic formula. Um, because certainly we have some, we have a, um, a large number here uh, uh, to work with. Um, and honestly, what I would do in, in this case, um, I would go ahead and use the uh, quadratic formula, which I'll do over here. Uh, so t is equal to um, 24 plus or minus square root of uh, 24 squared minus 4 times 1 times 432 um, all over 2. Um, and move this up a bit. Um, cleaning this up a bit, so that's t is equal to 12 plus or minus one half times square root of, and when we work out all of this, um, okay, oh, that should be a minus 432, so 4ac, so minus 4 times 1 times minus 432. Um, okay. And uh, what we get is uh, so the number under the radical sign is 2,304, um, which actually is a perfect square, as your calculator will tell you. Um, so that's equal to uh, the square root of 2,304 is uh, 48. So then you get 12 plus or minus 48 over 2. So 12 plus or minus 24. Um, so for plus or minus, you get 36, and you also get minus 12. But only the positive time value is what uh, is physically relevant here. So 36 is uh, what we're going here. I and mean, yes, you can try factoring it. I, I don't really care which approach you take, um, but if you don't feel like doing a trial and error factoring, there's always this. Um, when it is hitting a ground, um, what is the velocity? So uh, since we know it's hitting the ground at uh, time 36, uh, what we need to do is uh, substitute that into the derivative. So S prime of 36. Um, so we go back to the derivative, so it's minus 4t plus 48. Um, so S prime of 36 equals minus 4 times 36 plus 48. Um, and the actual value of it is minus 96, but it's what rate is a projectile falling. Um, so 96 is what you would uh, put in here. Um, because um, you know, DSDT, the derivative, uh, the rate of change of height with respect to time, um, is uh, that, that's an indication of uh, how the um, projectile is rising, and so when it, it's actually falling, then that's going to be negative. But this is asking what rate of projectile falling is when we don't include the minus sign here. Okay, um, the very last problem, uh, nasty uh, um, minimization problem. So uh, we're constructing this kind of a rectangular pen with these two interior fences, and we're trying to minimize um, the cost. Um, so we have a different cost 
per foot for uh, exterior fencing versus uh, interior fencing. So first, how much fencing of each type do we have? So exterior fencing, uh, we have uh, X here, X here, Y here, and Y here. So 2X plus 2Y. Um, so therefore, the exterior cost is 2X plus 2Y, all of that times $20.40. Um, and then we have uh, interior fencing is just X and X, so it's just going to be 2X. Um, so then the interior cost will just be uh, 2X times uh, the cost of the interior fencing per foot. Um, so that's times 12, so that's just like, going to be 24X. Um, and similarly over here, we're going to have uh, 40, 80 times X plus 40, 80 times Y. Whoops, don't want to do that. OK. Um, now, we have the cost now, but it's as a function of two variables. We only know how to take the min or max involving one. But here's where we use the fact that the total area is uh, 1836 uh, square feet. Um, so what is the area? Well, the area is going to be x times y. Um, so we can use that to express y in terms of x. And then we can use this expression for y in here to uh, have a function of only uh, one variable. So the total cost. And that's what we want to minimize. It's going to be uh, 4080x plus 24x. So we add those together. We get 6480x plus uh, 4080 times y, which is this. Over x. Um, all right. Let's see if that works out nicely. Probably not, but yeah, I'm not going to bother with that. Um, OK, so now we need to take the derivative of this. Um, so I'll just call this uh, C of X for convenience. Um, oh, I just realized I'm almost out of time. <laughs> so uh, C prime is 6480 minus 4080 times 1836 over X squared, because derivative of 1 over X is minus 1 over x squared, and we set that equal to 0. Um, so x squared is equal to um, 4080 times 1836 divided by 6480. I'm just carrying out the algebra on that. Um, and that turns out to be 1156. Um, Uh, so we just take a, so x squared is 1156, so x turns out to be 34. Um, so then once you have that value of x, that's what goes in here, then you use this relationship, 1836 divided by 34, which works out to be 54, and that's your answer. So, so what you do is you use the area to express y in terms of x, so then you can express the cost, which may be easier to express using both x and y, but then you can get rid of y by expressing it in terms of x so you have a function of only x and that's what you take a minimum of, find a minimum of using the usual procedure um, so the last few minutes does anyone have any questions about any one of these 13 problems Uh, how did you, how find did you find Repeat, please. How did you, how did you find find that? Oh, um, using this, the total area inside a pen is 1836. And if you look at the pen here, how do you get the area? So it's uh, um, 
width times height, x times y. So since that's the area and you're given the area 1856, we must have this relationship. And then all I did was I just solved, took this equation and solved it for y. So a lot of these problems that are involving multiple quantities, you have to use fall back on other information to give you about the problem. You're trying to minimize the cost, but it's this extra information that allows you to eliminate one of the variables so that you only have one left to deal with. So all of these applied max-min problems work that way. Any other questions? Okay, I'll end the recording at this point. Um, I apologize for any uh, mistakes I made, and I will, for those problems, I will refer to for problems and notes you should look at where everything is worked out in a pristine fashion. Um, so I will get this with all my annotations posted um, in Canvas um, along with this video. And I'll stick around if anyone has uh, uh, any questions. Have a good, Have a good